off. So hi, I'm, I'm Andrew Gall. I lead uh, AIM of R. I've been working in the sort of space for about 20 years now in supporting corporates with their venturing and startup. I came across Edward probably about five or six years ago, wasn't it, Edward? I think I was following you with your, uh, when you launched your book, China Disruptors. So it's really good to have you here today. Thank you, Andrew, it's my pleasure. So myself and uh, Edward, what we're going to do is um, give some introductions and over. So I said, I've got a short presentation to give some context. And then the main meat of today's session is uh, Edward, who is going to be giving some perspectives on China's disruptors, which was the name of one of his books. Um, but I've been following Edward for many years on uh, LinkedIn and his publications through his consulting business and uh, being on the TV and in the press and that within, uh, within China. Uh, we have a YouTube channel which has um, previous ones available. And then we've got some workshops around strategic innovation and venturing for uh, organizations that are corporate venturing. And we have a detailed venture capital case study and a video case study we're doing with, with Unilever. The other interesting topic that AIM of ours running at the moment is around quantum computing and commercialization in that space. So feel free to get in touch if that's of interest. And another based on um, uh, video uh, interviews with um, a venture fund and a startup. So do look those up on Eventbrite. So the, the meat of today's discussion is really around China disruptors. Now I've been traveling back and forth to China for about 17 years, been working um, with corporates and their innovation and venturing probably for about 12 years. Um, and these are just a few images that I put in my book in, in the section around global innovation superpowers. In that chapter, I probably did about one sentence about Silicon Valley, about a paragraph about Israel and the rest of the chapters about China. And Edward, I'd be really great to get your perspectives because I think, you know, I read your book before I published my book and, and some of the things that you said resonated with me and I've, I, I've, I've got that perspective as well on how China is changing. So I caricatured this back um, um, nearly 10 years ago now in what I termed the Great Wall of China, that the China markets have been really quite difficult for Western companies to get into with the, um, the language, the culture, but also the, the internet wall, which has allowed the development of some of these China disruptors. Um, what I termed the new Silk Road, um, which is different to the, so maybe what, the, what it currently means with the one belt, one road, sort of policy. But what I meant by this was China's manufacturing has developed from cheap mass produced products like toys to now leading electronic goods. And as um, some of you on this session, um, like sort of Angelica and uh, Thomas knows of the, the likes of uh, Neo, the electric car um, business coming out of China. So now very high quality, very high sophisticated sort of devices. So, so China being a manufacturing base for, for building these technologies. And, and as we've seen then the, the rise of things like um, you know, the, the rise of China in, in its manufacturing and value add that it's, um, that it's gained in that over the years. Then the, 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 other, the other perspective I've got is what I term enter the dragon where these China corporates and with government support and the strategy that comes from developing their capabilities, and we're going to touch on today the, the 14th five-year plan, is now building the capabilities in China to be leaders in telecoms, high-speed trains, solar panels, um, and, and lots of new sort of technologies and new business models and that as well. So that's a bit of a perspective from me, which I've outlined, uh, which I outlined in... Um, in my latest book, Purpose to Performance. Um, so those are available on the Eventbrite sort of site. So Edward, China Disruptors for me was, um, was a really interesting book, really well put together, um, but now a few years out of date and things have been moving quite fast. But maybe you could kick off by giving us some context to the China Disruptors and how maybe it's changed over the last number of years, please. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, 
uh, I'm very uh, pleased to be here uh, this morning, your time, evening, my time. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in fact, uh, when I published China Disruptors back in 2015, uh, in a way that was already late by my own point of view. Uh, you know, I have had the, the fortune of having worked in China, as you know, since the early 90s. And, uh, you know, I was representing the Boston Consulting Group uh, at that time. And, uh, you know, that was very early days, as you, we, you know, we remember. That was the sort of the beginning of uh, China's opening up uh, for foreign investment in a significant manner. And we were quite lucky because, you know, we went into China uh, sort of ahead of all the other international consulting firms. And uh, yet, uh, just because, uh, you know, when Deng Xiaoping made the visit to Shenzhen uh, in 1992, to remind people in Beijing to continue to open up and reform, that actually also opened up a floodgate gate for multinational companies to come to China. And we were there to receive the demand from a lot of multinationals. And so we're quite lucky. Uh, I was personally very lucky. Uh, but along the way, uh, I was also able to get in touch with uh, many Chinese companies who at that time were quite rudimentary, very primitive. Many of them didn't really understand what modern corporate management was all about. But I say one thing that already was very uh, striking about these Chinese companies uh, during the early and the mid nineties uh, was that uh, all of them have demonstrated or shown incredible curiosity about what's going on outside of China, uh, you know, about the Western companies. All of them are very interested in how the best in class multinational companies run the business. And uh, they had the impression that someone like the Boston Consulting Group being a stalwart US headquartered management consulting firm would have all the knowledge <laughs> and all the treasure about <laughs> how multinational run the business. And so they came to us and I was, you know, being the managing partner for China for BCG. So naturally I was on the receiving side. And as an ethnic Chinese, I was able to communicate directly with, you know, with these Chinese uh, entrepreneur companies uh, in, uh, in the local language. And so that gave me a very unique perspective about what's going on in China, perhaps, soon earlier than almost everyone else. And, and, and at a vantage point that perhaps no one else was able to, to have, certainly at that time. And perhaps over the next couple of decades as I continue to work in China, because having that direct interactions with the Chinese entrepreneurs and the Chinese ecosystem really, including both, uh, of course, the privately owned companies, but also the state-owned companies and also uh, government officials and people who are associated with the government like industry, industry associations of various industries and so on. I, I think it gave me uh, a very direct a way of understanding what's going on in China, certainly from the standpoint of innovations and entrepreneurship, but also uh, giving me the opportunity to, to, to triangulate different sources of information and that really helped me to form a certain set of opinions and perspectives about what's going on in China and how that's evolving. I say that I've sensed the butts or the seeds of China's innovation uh, as early as the early 90s and the mid 90s among these very nascent Chinese entrepreneurs. And by the way, Ch China, or the PRC didn't really have any entrepreneurship for the th first 30 years of its existence. It only came about, as you know, at the end of the Cultural Revolution, at the end of the 70s, when Deng Xiaoping uh, sort of took on power and Deng Xiaoping was willing to experiment uh, sort of a new ways or new ways of 
developing China. And he actually didn't have a blueprint, as you know. Uh, he was trying to do experiments. He was trying to cross the river by filling little stones. And one of the thing, things that he did was to allow entrepreneurship to, in a way, to return to China because before the PRC was formed, entrepreneurship was pretty vibrant in China for many, many years, for many, different, many millennia. But, uh, but, uh, but that was a big deal for China. And it took China really uh, several decades to get to where uh, China is today. But I say once Deng Xiaoping allowed entrepreneurship to return to China, the Chinese people really took that as an opportunity. And so we already saw the first generation of the return of the Chinese entrepreneurs in the 80s. And then, uh, as I mentioned, in the 90s. And of course, you know, to 2000s and then this decade, uh, sorry, this past decade and until now, I say that that growth has been exponential. Uh, if you look at this from a cross section of, you know, time, but also involve different generations. I, I say, China's entrepreneurship have gone through at least four to five different generations by now. So the 80s, the, the, the early 90s, the, the mid to, to late 90s, the 2000s, uh, the early 2010s, and all the way now. It's gone through different generations. And so when, I, when my book came out in 2015, I was actually trying to chronicle up to that point about what's been happening in China from the standpoint of entrepreneurship disruptions and, uh, and innovations. Uh, but the, in, the, the thoughts about writing the book actually started about a decade or so ago, so around 2005. And in fact, I began to collect information along the way as part of my consulting work. And, uh, and a lot of the information I collected had been available for quite a number, several years before I started I started writing the book and before the book came out. So that's why I said by the time the book came out, uh, quite a bit of information already, uh, already from my own standpoint, at least, is a bit uh, sort of dated uh, somewhat. But of course, you know, I think for the rest of the world and certainly also for a lot of people in China uh, or, or people like, like places like Hong Kong, which is physically close to China, but mentally far away from China, uh, at least at that time, uh, that that book was uh, was a big hit because people didn't quite recognize that in fact uh, entrepreneurship and innovation and disruptions were really taking place in China because as you know, for many people, uh, the impression about China up to that point or even now somewhat, but much less now. But I say you know, a decade or so ago, or even you know half of a decade ago. People's impression about China was that China was a copycat nation. People, you know, the Chinese just copy, and the Chinese have no considerations for intellectual property rights, and the Chinese are bad, right? I mean, that's the notion. And still, there's quite a bit of this notion now, as you know, in the international politics, certainly. But I think for businesses, people who, are, who know what's going on in China, who have direct interactions with the Chinese, business people, in particular, the privately owned entrepreneurs, uh, people begin now recognizing that actually a sea change has been going on. And that sea change is going from a copycat nation to perhaps uh, one of the world's most innovative, if not the most innovative nations from the standpoint of business model innovations. And so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of things has happened yeah. uh, since I returned to China, but also since the publishing of that book, and uh, as I think you asked me last time when we talked, when when would I come up with a new book? I, I'm planning I'm planning a new book uh, around this general topic, but I haven't come you know come about to sort of really starting writing it. But it's a it's a very quickly uh, fast evolving topic, but it's also very prevalent to a lot of people around the world. Not only people in China, but also people who. Are doing business in China and the impact or the effect of China for the rest of the world. So um, yeah, very prevalent topic. So I'm I'm very interested in the topic myself because you know this is what I do uh, as part of my as really my core business. So yeah. 
So that's the I, situation. I very much agree with you that the perception in in, in the West has changed, and and, and I, I can see your point that from 2005 to 2015, you're living this sort of stuff and you, you sort of see it. But I, I've experienced something similar. You know, when I've taken people that I had the pleasure of um, hosting Jack Maher in Henley in England in 2004, oh, yeah. I thought, right. well, this is really interesting, this Alibaba stuff. And then was following that through the decade, as you sort of said. But, you know, back in 2015, when you had the book out, you know, I was still there, you know, and, and traveling to China and starting to see things like the QR codes and the payments and the changing online services and that there. And the perception from, from the West is still, as you sort of said, yes, they did a bit of copying. They did catching up. But then the Americans came to England during the English Industrial Revolution and copied our spinning jennies and <laughs> copied our railroads. So, hey, that's, that's what the world is about and that's what the sort of change is. So just b- building on your China Disruptor book, you know, you, you talked about in, the, in Alibaba, of course, and Hire and, uh, and the BAT, BAT, the Baidu Alibaba sort of Tencent. What, where are we now? You know, so we're five, six years on from you p- publishing that book. Who are the disruptors now and what's the, the technology and the business models that you're seeing is really sort of disrupting and changing now? What's your view of that? Yeah, I, uh, as, as you said correctly, I profile quite a number of companies in my, in my previous book. And uh, of course, uh, these companies are by now well known both domestically within China, but also globally or internationally, right, outside of China. And, uh, you know, in the internet space, it, it was uh, BAT, or Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and uh, Xiaomi. I, I actually intentionally profile Xiaomi quite a bit. In fact, the subtitle of my book uh, was uh, Alibaba, Xiaomi, and Tencent. A lot of people actually didn't know Xiaomi at that time. A lot of people have heard about Ali and Tencent, but Xiaomi was quite unknown. But I I, uh, I knew Xiaomi was, was not going to be, uh, you know, a minor, minor company is going to be significant. So I put them in and sure enough, in the last, uh, you know, five, six years, it also has grown quite significantly. And recently, as many of you know, they've decided to go into uh, electrical vehicles as well, right? Like so many other people. Uh, and then in the non-internet space, you know, the stalwarts like, uh, I, I pull out uh, stalwarts like uh, Hire, Lenovo and of course Huawei in you know in particular Huawei actually quite a bit and of course everybody knows the story of how about Huawei by now uh, thanks to Donald Trump right and um, the the what I said in my book was that uh, uh, what I saw in China at that time was that uh, entrepreneurship or disruptors are happening in a very uh, China specific manner. Number one is that the uh, entrepreneurs are, are, are becoming quite young, actually, uh, are becoming younger, certainly, uh, younger than the entrepreneurs in the first generation, the second generation, as I mentioned, since the Deng Xiaoping came, to, came back to power. Uh, so secondly, is that uh, the entrepreneurs in China are typically much more geographically uh, dispersed compared to, let's say, to Amer- America. America has a lot of entrepreneurs too, but t- they tend to be quite concentrated geographically on the West Coast, uh, somewhat in the, uh, in the East Coast. But in the Midwest, it, it wasn't a whole lot or any, right? Uh, whereas in, in China, you know, we, we see them in Beijing, in Shanghai, in Hangzhou, in, of course, Shenzhen, big time. But also in the smaller cities, you know, cities along the coast, like in Fujian and and uh, also in central uh, central China, in Wuhan, Changsha, and those kind of places. So it's much more diverse. And and, and also the other dimension that I saw is that China has uh, a a very strong representation of female entrepreneurs, much more so than any other place in the world, including America. And I saw that because I actually interacted with many of them. And I say, I have incredible respect for the female entrepreneurs who, uh, you know, we, uh, they were having more or less the same footing of opportunities in China as compared to the male counterparts. 
and uh, and they work hard. They they very smart, and many of them are able to make it. And so, uh, I think I think the, the the nature of the Chinese entrepreneurship have actually given rise to a certain unique aspect about it. And along the way, in the last five years or so, five to six years, we've seen an emergence of uh, you know equally capable companies uh, who are like the the second generation or the next wave after the companies I mentioned in my book. Let's take the internet as an example, right? So at that time when I wrote the book, uh, you know, Alibaba was by far the dominant ones in e-commerce in, in China. And today you have JD.com, you have Pindodor and VIP Club and th those kind of companies. And of course you also have, you know, uh, companies who are now very strong in social commerce, uh, which I, as you know, I recently written an article and social commerce becoming a very fast growing aspect or part of, uh, of the, of the e-commerce yeah. and companies yeah. like, uh, you know, ByteDance with the, the TikTok or, or Douyin part of uh, ByteDance uh, is, is, is growing very fast, both within China, but also outside of China, as you know, companies like Bilibili, uh, companies like, like Kuaishou, these, these are really fast growing and very successful social you know, commerce platforms. And many of people outside of China didn't even, haven't really heard about, for example, companies like Kuaishou and, and Bilibili, but they're very popular, very strong in China. Yeah, and, I, I'd, I'd like to del delve into that a bit more because you know, as you said, you know, we know of Alibaba and that now, and you know, when I, when I met Jack and followed Alibaba from the early 2000s after SARS, you know, China has gone through this dot com, dot com and delivery sort of type um, yeah. e-com, which yeah. in the West almost we're only now doing because of the pandemic. Yeah. And, and then, you know, China's moved ahead with the social media. So, you know, an entrepreneur that I've been supporting, Rebecca Mortar at Lone Design Club, you know, is 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 in the sustainable fashion sort of type space. And we launched Lone Design Club in Shanghai in October 2019. And, you know, trying to get them to see, you know, the QR codes, the live streaming, that interaction. What are you seeing in that space now that is going to hit us in five years time or sort of something like that? Because I think the amount of time it's taken for Western companies to catch up with China. What, what sort of things are you seeing now that's happening that those companies you're mentioning? Oh, incredible. I mean, that that's, uh, you know, uh, social commerce is really a new way for companies to uh, connect themselves with their target customers or co target consumers, right? And previously, the way to do it was uh, quite, quite one, only one way, right? You, you do it through your advertisement, you know, like a newspaper or magazine or TV and so on. And it's a one way sort of, one way sort of communications. Social media, uh, social commerce actually create, uh, as you know, a a a a, a closed loop, a a, a a a a bilateral way of communication, and also not only a, with a specific individual like like Andrew, you, but it actually with a community, a community who are like you, who who share similar interests about certain things. Like, okay, I like outdoor, so. There's an outdoor community. Oh, I like cosmetics. There's a cosmetic, you know, a baby food, you know, so on. And and social commerce is a way to, you know, connect the uh, the, the the companies with the the target consumers through digital means and also through the use of, uh, you know, uh, prevalent uh, personalities like the the so-called KOLs, right? The the key opinion, opinion leaders, who are usually, uh, you know, well known have uh, influence and really can create a stickiness and resonance with the target customer. So that is that is what's really going on big time yeah. in China. Yeah. And, and you know, over time, one would expect that to continue to evolve to be become much more sophisticated. Yeah, and I think one of the imp really interesting points you made there, I would like to re-emphasize it, is this direct relationship and if people sort of see the, the live streaming that happens in China when uh, a key opinion leader might have a hundred phones in front of them, 
that's because they're connecting on different groups direct to their customers and they're not going like through a Facebook platform or, a, right. or you know, an Instagram platform. That's right. And I think that's really interesting that the, the business model in the West of the Googles and the Facebooks all being about advertising, that's being disrupted in China because they, they, Absolutely. they're going around them. That's, that, that, that's, a re that's really important to emphasize, isn't I it? Think, I, think, I, I think the, 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 the real uh, important note to understand is that um, uh, the, it's a paradigm shift in, in the way to connect to the consumers or the customers, to the, to the people. And before it was, uh, I would say, you know, it, you know the the way that the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, you, you know, is more, is more digital economy, right? It is the digital economy. Increasingly, these companies, the social commerce companies, are deploying algorithms to really, you know, to uh, to to create more sophisticated affiliation with the target consumers. So it's no longer just a one-way digital sort of. Uh, connections, but it's actually a a closed loop, manipulative, algorithm based uh, relationship, and and so uh, you you don't need to find them; they can they can find you, right? And they actually could know you more than you know yourself. That's the scary part of it. But from the business standpoint, is is very interesting. And I say today the Chinese are are doing a lot of experiments on how to do that better. You know, someone like a ByteDance or TikTok, let's take, take an example. I mean, you know, if you, if you think about this, it, it's pretty simple and naive, right? A video platform showing some, you know, young people dancing, singing, doing some funny things. It, it sounds simple, right? It's, you know, anyone can do that in theory. But TikTok was able to emerge from a big crowd and to become the leading platform and, and it's become very sticky. It is because behind it, there's a set of very sophisticated algorithms which keep on actually being refined and you know being fine-tuned almost every day by a large group of uh, algorithm sort of engineers or data scientists. So, yeah. so that, that's, that's the part that's really driving a lot what's yeah. going on behind these kind of business models. So, so a, a topic I'd like to raise before we come to questions and that from the group, and I see people- but Let me, let me finish uh, answering your initial question, uh, if you don't mind, just uh, uh, one more comment. Sure, go ahead. Before you, yeah, because uh, you asked me about you know, which other disruptors, because I know that uh, some, some of your, 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 your audience is in the mobility, automotive industry, and so on. I also want to make a mention that uh, you know, the, among all the other sectors, one of the most fast changing and most disruptive sectors is the automotive and mobility sector. And, uh, you know, we have seen, of course, you know, Tesla coming to China and setting up a wholly owned operations and doing quite well, actually. But at the same time, we also didn't see the emergence of the Chinese disruptors as well. And you know the company like Neil that some of you have worked for before, and and certainly, but but not only Neil, right? I think there's a whole bunch of other sort of what we call new force disruptors, the new force, the new auto force in China. So someone someone like Xpeng, someone like uh, Li Auto, another company called WM Motors is not listed yet, but should be on the way at some point in time. But we also are, are seeing, uh, you know incumbent OEMs who are trying to transform themselves from a traditional sort of automaker into a, uh, a, um, a, 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 a mobility, auto mobility player, which is resting on the notion of, uh, you know, the, all the vehicles is going to be intelligent, connected, uh, and uh, of course, uh, increasingly uh, driven by new energy sources and over time become autonomous. And so that change is incredible. And a lot of companies are involving, but a lot of them actually are disruptors, the Chinese disruptors who came from nowhere. Some of them like the Neos of the world, but also a lot of the internet players or non-internet players are jumping into the, the game as well. Xiaomi, as I mentioned, as announced is gonna do 
go into the, the, the NGV space. Uh, you know, even Evergrande, who is, who is a real estate developer, also has uh, set up their own GV subsidiaries and so on. So it's becoming very hotly debate, uh, competed space as well, but very exciting because with the competition and collaborations along the way, we would expect much more innovation that will be coming in the automobility and automobility space uh, in due course. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a great point you raised there. And, and the, the, the outline that I put in my book, as you know, I, I sent to you, there's what I term the innovative new value chain. Yeah. How these different technologies are going to connect together because the electric vehicle is a very different platform to the internal combustion one. Yeah. The energy infrastructure and clean energy you need is very different. Yeah. The autonomous models that then come about when you've got autonomous vehicles, that's a very different value chain. And which country and which companies are going to have the capabilities in those different sort of ch chains and that. I, I'm yeah. conscious of time. And I, I, okay. one question I'd, I'd like to get your perspective on, the 14th five-year plan, you know, people need to understand and read that. Uh, you know, I ran an event with uh, a GE in Paris with a bunch of different corporates about four or five years ago. And I printed out some key sections from the 13th plan and gave it to these executives that were running hundreds of millions of pounds and dollar funds. And they were like, oh, like they hadn't read it, hadn't understood it, hadn't sort of saw the strategic energy behind it. What should we look out for now in the 14th five-year plan that is going to be impacting businesses and um, you know China and, and the rest of the world. What's your view on those key, key, key things that we need to look out for? Right, as you know, Andrew, the role of these five-year plans is critical in China's uh, governance model. And over the years, you know, different five-year plans have driven uh, the, the, the growth and development of China in certain di di direction. I say, you know, if you look at the last, you know, three, four decades, the performance of China has been pretty well. To a, to a large extent, it's due to the effectiveness of these different five-year plans. And the 14 five-year plan came out, and I say there are two major themes to that that's worth a uh, foreign investor to take a, a take, take look of. One is the emphasis on the so-called double circulation of economic policy. Double circulation meaning, uh, you know, there's an internal circulation of supply and demand within China but also uh, there's gonna be an external circulation, which is China's you know, trade with the rest of the world. And two things is gonna happen at the same time. Of course, in the last 30 years, with, the, you know, with that phase of the globalization, uh, China rely a lot on the international trade with the rest of the world, in particular with the Western countries. Uh, but but you know, China is now foreseeing that in addition to that international trading relationship, China will also can, will build up the internal uh, supply and demand cir circle, mainly because of the rise of the Chinese uh, middle class, that the Chinese middle class have now become, uh, a, a, have reached a certain critical mass. Some, some people say, you know, it's already in the range of three to 400 million people already in the so-called middle class in China. And that, that number is gonna continue to grow. So, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is, is innovation in the five, you know, in the in the four, 14 five year plan. The innovation also includes two aspects. One aspect is institutional innovation. In other words, within the in institutions in the Chinese system, in particular in the government, but also how the government relates to the society. Uh, uh, the Chinese uh, government is is committed to create more innovation or more changes or transformation within their own internal institutions in order to push along the, the growth agenda uh, uh, and, and also the social responsibility agenda much more, uh, much more proactively. Uh, the other aspect of innovation is, I think, is where a lot of foreign investors should be very interested in is how technology will continue to play a major role in helping to drive China's innovation agenda. That is, instigated by two things. One is how, as we've been talking about, how successful already uh, you know, for the last uh, decade or more on how these business model innovation is driven primarily by the entrepreneurs have already demonstrated. 
So the central government have registered that and they continue to support that. The other is about real technology innovation. Uh, it, that's just, this has been instigated by how uh, the previous US administration have uh, started with the, the sanctions on some of the core technologies like the semiconductor chips uh, to, su to supply to the, to, the, uh, to the Chinese manufacturers. And, uh, and that really have shaken up the Chinese senior leadership uh, that uh, you know, no longer they can really rely on foreign supplies of this kind of core technologies. They, they need to, or we need to sort of have our own, own supplies. And so, you know, that has become a major part of the agenda is to really uh, be increasingly more self-reliant on this kind of core technology like the chip supply. So, so I think that's also a major theme. The other theme, which is also going to be very prevalent to foreign investors, is a longer term commitment to uh, sustainability, the commitment to become carbon neutral by 2060 uh, was a bold move, as you know. And actually not many people expected that, but President Xi Jinping actually came out and made that pledge. Uh, and, and that's a bold, bold move, but also pretty challenging. And, uh, but, but we know that once the, the party or the government decided that, that, is the, <clears throat> that is the target, they'll go about doing it. But to do that will require a lot of contribution from a lot of different players, including the domestic companies, local uh, governments, but also from a lot of foreign companies who have the capability and technology and are willing to work with the Chinese to try to uh, enhance or to advance its agenda. So I say those are the really most, most important objectives yeah. or targets. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I agree, and and you know, for the for those on this call or ones watching the video, that they've got to go and read the plan. They've got to keep up to it because, as you said, this comes down from the five-year plan down to what happens in the provinces, what down to what happens in the cities. I was I was running a program in uh, Minhang in Shanghai in 2016, and we had the governor ca came and visited and, and asked for our advice. You know, asking us for advice, and he said. Next year, we're going to build 25 smart robot factories in our little bit of Shanghai. And it was <laughs> like, wow, you know, this is the, you know, this is the scale, the speed, you know, and this is the whole net carbon thing. I think having that plan and then having the entrepreneurs drive in behind it, I think is, is great. So like, those are the questions I want to cover. It's been fantastic oversight. We've got, and Edward, I think there's a demand here for your, your next English book, <laughs> which will be as you said, five years out of date for you, but probably 10 years ahead of the time for us. So um, we really appreciate your time and th thank you very much, my friend. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.